All right. 1 Corinthians 11 this morning. As the board mentioned, uh, we've been in 1 Corinthians for a number of months, a number of months, going all the way back to the summer. And uh, we're moving right along. We're a little over halfway through the book this morning. And as I alluded to, um, I have something of a reputation in this church for speaking on only controversial issues. Well, I'm not going to want to disappoint you this, this morning. Um, I'm speaking on one of the, the tougher passages in the Bible, and so, of course, I'm going to you know, make this controversial as I possibly can. No, hopefully not, but, uh, but I am speaking on a number of, of sensitive issues. Um, I, I mean, partly I do this. It's probably the way I'm wired. When I go to the Bible, it's the passages that are really tough to understand that I linger over. I mean, those are the ones that I really spend a lot of time on. So then when these passages come up and are preaching, I say, hey, I'll take that because I, I spend a lot of time there. Um, but partly it's also because I think the issues that are sometimes most sensitive are because of the issues that matter most in some ways. I mean, usually it's, it's the stuff that really matters to us that, that can cause us anxiety. And this is simply inescapable. And even though there's a risk in that, that you know, the speaker at the front might get it wrong sometimes, I think it would be um, an abrogation of our duty as ministers and as teachers of the word to simply gloss over the tough parts. So I want to just ask that. Um, you be open this morning if anything I say challenges you. Um, and critical. I'm in process. I may not get everything perfectly right. Uh, this morning should be three sermons, straight up. Uh, and it's, again, it's one of those things I got into and I'm like, oh boy, I'm going to have to cut a lot out because I'm speaking three, you know, what should be three sermons uh, in one. But hopefully it will at least inspire you to think about this passage, to dig in a little deeper, and, and spur you on to growth in Jesus. All right. So with that being said, let's get into our text. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 2. This is one of those cases where the chapter was divided poorly. And so the first verse in the chapter should really go uh, with the end of chapter 10. And our, our new section picks up in verse 2. And we're going to be reading through verse 16. Verse 2, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Well, as I already said, um, the issues today that I'm going to talk about today are a bit rough. And that's partly because this passage is really hard to understand. Um, when I told my wife the other day that I was speaking on this passage, she was like, well, you probably don't need to read it anymore. Like, all you have to do is read on that passage. Um, I've literally probably throughout the years read over a thousand pages of secondary literature on this passage. And the interesting thing that you find is when you read various commentaries, various entire books written on it, you won't find a single two scholars that agree on every point. Not a single two. Um, virtually every phrase in this passage is debated. Um, and that's not only true of New Testament scholars, but even classical scholars. There's some debate, for example, over what the, the practice of head covering was in the ancient world. So, so I say that to say this is a really tough passage, um, but I'm going to try to keep it um, 
as brief and as applicable as I can by just kind of summarizing the sermon in three points. And by way of doing that, I'm going to address a lot of the things that you might have questions about in the passage, but not everything. There's some things that I'm just leaving to the side, right? Like the phrase, because of the angels. If you want to talk about it after, we can talk about it. I have no idea what it means. I have no idea. I mean, I, mean, I have ideas that it could mean, but none of them are, are, are that satisfactory. Um, so, so there are simply a number of things I'm going to gloss over. Um, so I say that to say, if you want to, to chat more, I'll be available after the sermon to do so. So point one, all right? If you're going to take notes, I mean, these are, I'm going to give you three points, write those down and, and, and fill in as you as you'd like. So point one is this. This passage teaches us that men and women are equally gifted to serve the church. Men and women are equally gifted to serve the church. Now, I think this is a really important point of this passage and one that is often missed. There is a history of interpretation surrounding this passage in the church that's trying to make the passage say the exact opposite of what I think it's saying. Because verse, excuse me, because verse 3 says that, quote, the head of woman is man, end quote, many people have interpreted this to mean that essentially man is the boss of woman, and they've turned then the whole passage into a message about how man's boss and women need to dress in a way that acknowledge that fact. I think that's completely wrong. I'm going to say verse 3 for the end of my discussion of this section. Because I think it becomes clear what the matter for in verse 3 means when we see how the argument in the passage unfolds. So, what is this passage about? Well, if I were to put it in one sentence, in the passage Paul is giving advice on appropriate headdress for men and women when they're doing public ministry together. That's what the passage is about. He specifically references men and women praying and prophesying. Now, I don't think this means that he's, what he's saying is limited to prayer and prophecy. Uh, rather, I think he's using these two, um, these two words to sum up the two kinds of speech that happen in church. Speech that is directed to God, which is prayer, and speech from God to the congregation. In other words, prophecy. That's essentially what prayer and prophecy are. Speech directed to God and speech that is in some way inspired and is to the congregation. In that sense, prayer would, of course, also include things like the gift of tongues, and prophecy would include things like teaching or encouragement or exhortation. It's not that it's just when, when women pray or prophesy that they should have a head covering, and then otherwise, if they do any other anything else, they can remove it. No, these words are summing up this speaking ministry in the church. Now, don't miss this point. The passage completely assumes that men and women are participating in the speaking gifts together. If we read the passage and only talk about head coverings, it is to miss the point that head coverings are only being talked about by Paul in the context of women speaking in the church. That is the occasion that gives rise to his discussion over appropriate dress. It assumes that God gives women just like men to speak and lead in the church. Because of that, I want to suggest that, that those that think that the only churches that allow women to speak from the pulpit are those that have deviated from Scripture simply haven't read their Bibles closely enough. The women in Corinth were speaking to the church, and it is only in light of that fact that Paul was saying anything about the matter of appropriate dress. So to bring this home, ladies, I want to challenge you this morning that if you discern a call of God on your life to teach and to preach, find solace that that desire is itself a good thing. That desire is good and it may be because God does want to use you to speak and minister to people just as much as he wants to use godly men. The age in which we live is one in which the spirit of prophecy has been poured out, in the words of Joel, which Peter quotes, on young and old, slave and free, and male and female. 
Peter quotes this prophecy from Joel in his Pentecost sermon and says that this is evidence of the fact that we are living in the, the last age, the eschatological age in which God will pour his spirit out on all without distinction, all who turn to Christ, that is. So ladies, if God has gifted you to teach his people, then not doing so may be an act of disobedience. Refusing the call because of perhaps social pressure or what you've been taught may be an act of disobedience. Have the boldness to step out into your calling and watch what God will do through you. Now let's get back to verse 3. So if Paul's affirming the equal giftedness of men and women in this passage, as I'm suggesting, and is not suggesting that men are women's bosses, then what does he mean by the phrase, the head of woman is man. What is he doing by starting out this passage in this way? Well, first we need to understand that head is being used as a metaphor in the passage. Right? We, uh, in our context, often use language like such and such is the head of this corporation or he is the head of the family. And when we use the term, we mean basically that the person is the leader. But that meaning is metaphorical. We sometimes forget that because we get so used to the way we use the language. The term head in both English and Greek literally means the part on top of your body. It's this thing. In both English and Greek, that's what a head is. Any other meaning, for example, we talk about the head of a corporation, is a metaphor on the fact that this is the top part of the body. Now, there is some evidence in ancient Greek that the word head could sometimes be used as a metaphor from leader. And I can talk more about this if you have any more questions, but from my survey of the evidence, this does not seem to be a very common usage at the time of Paul or prior, and the meaning does not fit the passage well at all. Another metaphorical meaning that existed during this time, and which does fit the context of the passage well, is an idea of source, or particularly source of life. Greek doctors believed that the head was the source of many functions in the body. They even believed that sperm originated in the head. From an ancient context, you know, sperm looks a little like mucus that comes out of our nose. And so you had some ancient doctors theorizing that, well, that's where it comes from. And so in this way, the head was literally the source of life for offspring. Now, if you read the passage closely, you'll see that this idea of source is present. Authority is only present if it's assumed based on the meaning of head. But what the passage does clearly uh, point to is this idea of source. In verse 8, Paul references the creation narrative in Genesis 2 and says, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Man is the source of woman's life in creation. This idea also makes sense of the way the word head is used in the other two pairings in verse 3. Verse 3 reads, But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Those that argue that the meaning of head is authority are forced to say that God is Christ's authority. And without getting into the history of, of doctrine, this comes awfully close to the heresy of subordinationism that was rejected by the early church. Furthermore, if the verse was intending to teach a chain of authority, you would expect the order, if you look at verse 3, to be God, Christ, Christ, man, man, woman. That's how change of authority works. But that's not the order. The order, rather, fits with a chronological sense of uh, someone's source in creation. As Christ was the source of man in creation, the first pairing, man was the source of woman. And God was the source of Christ in his incarnation, in his coming to earth. This idea, again, fits with a chronological sequence of what Paul is setting up, which is particularly an argument about how man and woman should honor each other, partly because of creation differences. Paul makes this uh, point right at the beginning of the passage because he's going to talk more about creation of man and woman in verse 8. 
The passage, and I think, does not teach at all that men are to be in charge of women in the church. Rather, it affirms the equal giftedness of both man and woman. Point two. Hope that I haven't already upset some of you. Because there's like an escalating controversial system. There's an increasing controversy as I get through this sermon, so that's the easy point. We're used to it. Yeah, exactly, used to it. If, if you're new to the church, I promise you that most speakers don't, don't do things the way I do. They're a little more gracious and less controversial. All right, point two. Let's keep getting into it. Point two is this. While men and women are equally gifted by the Spirit, they are not the same. Men and women are not the same. Let's look at verses 7 to 12 again. <coughs> a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. The instructions Paul gives about appropriate dress for men and women is grounded in creation realities. Paul grounds his argument for a distinction between the sexes and dress and the fact that men and women were created differently. He says that men were created in the image and glory of God. Now, notice that he does not say, when he goes on to reference the women, that women are the image and glory of man. He leaves the term image off and only says that women are the glory of man. I think this is intentional, because Paul knows his Bible. And in Genesis 1, it says that humankind was created in the image of God as male and female. So Paul's intentional in leaving off the term image when he says that woman is the glory of man. But Paul does say, in fact, that whereas man is the glory of God, woman is the glory of man. What does Paul mean? This is another area that I think uh, has been badly misunderstood. Maybe this is just an autobiographical the way I've understood things in the past, but... Glory is not a pejorative word. It's not a negative word. And I think when we approach this passage, many treat it when it says that woman is the glory of man as though it is a negative thing. I think we've often read it to say that whereas men were created in the image of God, or glory of God, women were only created in the glory of man. Man, glory of God, women, only glory. That would be odd if Paul's using it that way, because glory is a glorious term in the Bible. It is not a negative term. I think Paul is actually making the opposite point from this idea that, right, that women have a lesser glory. Glory basically means the reflected radiance of something. It's kind of a simple working definition. The reflected radiance of someone or something. Humanity was created to reflect the radiance of God, but woman was also created to reflect the radiance of man. In this sense, she is, so to speak, the glory of the glory. This is why Paul goes on to say that woman came from man, and she was created because of him. I prefer the translation because of to for in verse 9, because again, I think the word for is often misunderstood. We read this passage to say, woman is kind of a lesser glory than man, and she was basically created for him to be his plaything. But this word for, in the next verse, is translated because of, when it says because of the angels. The idea is that woman was created because of man. If you think back to Genesis, to the creation account in Genesis 2, 
In this passage, it is, in this passage, it is in response to Adam's realization that there is nothing in creation that is suitable to be his partner that God creates Eve. She was created in response to something Adam was lacking. She was created because Adam was not intended to, to do life alone. And remember Adam's response. He looks at her and declares, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He found her glorious. I think Paul is using this term glory to do double duty. On the one hand, he's referencing the fact that woman, in fact, did come from man, and because of that, there are differences rooted in creation. But I think Paul is also making the point that man, since Adam, has found woman glorious. She reflects the radiance of man. In other words, in a passage, as we will see, that is talking about appropriate dress, using a symbol that without which often symbolized sexual availability, this passage is full of language that has to do with a woman's beauty. And in that context, he says that woman was created to glory man, to reflect his radiance. Paul, I think, playing here with the idea that man finds her beautiful. Yes, glory means she was taken from him, but it is also precisely because of this reason that man finds her glorious. When I fell for Amanda, it was partly because I found her glorious. And that's partly that I found her beautiful, if you're not getting what I'm saying here. that Paul is making a positive statement about women in this verse by, by referring to her as the glory of man is also confirmed by his conclusion to this argument that we find in verse 10. In verse 10, he follows this argument by saying, it is for this reason, for the reason that she is the glory of man, that she ought to have authority over her own head. I won't get into the history of interpretation on this passage, but if your Bible says something a little different, come and talk to me. There's an early commentary on 1 Corinthians written from the 20th century in which a Greek scholar basically says, what is so hard to understand is why Paul would say that a woman has authority when in fact he means the exact opposite, that she's under authority. Because the Greek doesn't mean she's under authority. It cannot mean that. There's no evidence that this Greek construction can mean that. It says she has authority over her own head. That follows because Paul has just made a positive statement about the glory of woman. As I stated in point two, this argument Paul is making tells us to use Paul words that gender differences themselves, things in implication are glorious. They are not something that we should try to do away with, either by clever philosophical arguments or by attempting to change reality by manipulating the body. God created us as male and female, and this is a good thing. This is a glorious thing. Part three. We'll see. Maybe this is more controversial. I'll let you be the judge. Our clothing communicates a message about our philosophy of gender. More broadly, our clothing simply communicates a message about our values. That may be a more accurate way of saying it, gender being one of those values. But our clothing communicates a message about our values. Now this point is a little more messy because it relates to issues of culture and tradition. And these are issues which many of us in the West are not particularly fond of. A couple times throughout this sermon, I, I think I referenced American culture. But a number of intellectuals today are actually speaking of the American social experience as one of anti-culture. There's not an American culture to these intellectuals, but rather simply an American anti-culture. 
And this term is used to point to the idea that even while we as Americans have claimed to be multicultural, the reality is that because of our devotion to the idea of unbridled individualism, that your sense of self is completely determined by your own individual choices, your own sense of, of psychological self, that we are actually hostile and destructive to virtually every cultural expression. You can have a particular culture only if it does not impinge upon the so-called rights of the individual. But of course, every culture sets boundaries for what is expected of an individual. This is what culture is. A culture is at least in part defined by its beliefs, customs, and traditions. Because of this, cultures are tolerated in American life only to the extent that they align with our ideas of individual autonomy. You can dress the way you want as long as you recognize everyone else's dress as equally legitimate. You can have your own sexual practices as long as you affirm everyone else in theirs. Well, almost everyone else. Right? After all, right now, we don't have too much of a problem with not being inclusive to an incestuous couple, for example. Because incest is one of those things that we still have a taboo about. I thought this after I spoke on 1 Corinthians 5, talking about the incestuous couple. And I walked away and said, huh, I didn't have the anxiety that I usually have when I'm speaking about another hot-button sexual issue. Interesting. Well, it's because in general, that's still a taboo in our culture. But the maintenance of this taboo may in fact only be a result of unthinking prejudice at least according to the reigning philosophy of our modern times. Notwithstanding the few sexual taboos we do still have, you better not, in the name of your cultural inheritance, make any judgments about an individual's expression of their sexuality. The reality is that our conception of multiculturalism is deeply hostile to any expression of culture that does not conform to the individualistic philosophy of our times. In contrast to this individualistic approach, Paul recognized in this passage that the way you express yourself says something about the culture in which you are a part. The head covering in ancient Rome was worn by the matron, that is, the married woman. That's who wore the head covering in Rome. One of the things it signaled in Roman society was that a, uh, a woman was sexually unavailable. When an honorable woman left the home, an honorable wife, excuse me, left the home, she would don her head with a covering as a means of showing that she belonged to another man and was thus not to be treated as an object of sexual desire. For some, such as female slaves, this meant they could never wear the head covering because marriage was not recognized for slaves. Even though you had kind of de facto marital relationships, marriage itself was not legally recognized for any slaves. And their status meant that they were always at the whims of their master's sexual desires. Slaves were perpetually sexually available. They had no sexual autonomy. For unmarried free girls, they were at least you know, available for a marriage to be arranged, and so they did not wear the veil to signal their availability. Men, on the other hand, did not wear a veil except in the context of some pagan religious ceremonies. All right, we'll see if it gets a little sloppy here because I somehow missed a couple pages of my notes. So now I'm going off the cuff. Now, this makes good sense of the passage when we understand the way that clothing signals messages, it communicates nonverbal messages in a culture. This background to the veil in ancient Rome tells us why Paul is concerned with this. He starts off the passage by referencing how a man can bring dishonor on his head. Verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. As I mentioned, the 
the clearest evidence from the ancient world, from ancient Rome, of a man covering his head. I know you'll see some Jewish men do today. This seems to be something that was a, a later development, something that was after the destruction of the temple. Um, there's not good evidence that Jewish men regularly covered their heads prior to the destruction of the temple um, in their religious ceremonies. What we do have evidence for is that some pagan religious leaders, men, would cover their heads in their religious ceremonies. And this may give us a clue to why Paul is saying it is dishonorable for a man in the Christian assembly to cover his head. This was a practice borrowed from pagan culture. Now, I think this also, this is a side point, but I think this also actually indicates that it may have been the men and not the women that were calling for the women to remove their veils. The men were the problem. That's deeply counterintuitive. Again, there is kind of tradition reading this passage, assuming that the problem is with, with the women. But what we do know from, from earlier in 1 Corinthians is that the men were having a lot of issues with sexual promiscuity. You have the man being excommunicated in chapter 5 for having sex with his mother-in-law, and she's not mentioned because presumably she was outside the church. You have men being chastised for frequenting prostitutes. We know that the men in Corinth were basically following the sexual mores of the culture around them. This is a constant issue. So, while it's not clear why the men might have been calling for the women to remove their heads, okay. perhaps it was because they wanted to look. The reason I think the problem is with men, though, there, there are three reasons. The first reason is this verse 4. Paul mentions that it is dishonorable for a man to cover his head in passing. He focuses on the issue of, of the women covering their heads which indicates to us that his mentioning of it is not because it was actually a problem, but he rather mentions it to set up what he's going to say about the women. He assumes that the Corinthians will agree with him that it's dishonorable for a man to cover his head, and he uses that as his launching point to explain why it is in fact dishonorable if a woman doesn't. Now think about this. If you were a woman and you covered your head, and you presumably didn't care too much about the implications that had on, on honoring your, your husband. If I told you, well, you're dishonoring your husband or a man by uncovering your head, well, would it have much of an effect? You'd probably be like, well, yeah, I know. Or I don't care. But if Paul is setting up the argument by saying, hey, men, a woman who uncovers his head is acting in a way that is dishonorable to her head, in other words, the man, that's compelling hey, guys, you're actually dishonoring yourselves by calling on the woman to remove the veil. First reason. The second reason I think is likely that the men were the issue in the church is the climax of the argument in verse 8. Excuse me, uh, verse 10. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Again, the grammar demands that Paul is affirming the woman's authority over her own head. Now, the interesting thing about this verse is this is precisely where you expect Paul to say, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have her head covered. But he doesn't. And you've got a lot of commentaries saying, that's what he must mean. And so some Bibles insert sign of authority. There's no word for sign in the Greek. That's not there. But they say, that's what, where the argument's leading. Leading. Paul must mean that. And so they insert the word sign, they say sign of authority, which is the head covering. No, the passage says a woman ought to have authority over her own head. But this makes sense if it was in fact the woman that were desiring to cover her head. Then Paul's affirmation of her authority to do so is in line with his argument for the appropriateness of the headdress in this, in this context. The final reason is in verse 13 when Paul says, Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? He's using their masculine pronouns in the Greek. Greek is a gendered language. And he's using masculine pronouns. Now, this does not mean that it's necessarily only men he's speaking to, because the masculine pronoun can have a mixed audience, male and female. That's why a term like brothers is often translated as brothers and sisters in our Bibles, because many masculine words can have a, a generic meaning. But Paul could have used feminine pronouns if he was speaking only to women. 
because the feminine pronouns are not gender neutral. They refer only to women. But he uses masculine pronouns, which suggests at least that he's targeting a mixed audience, if not an audience of men only. That's a side point, but I think it's an interesting side point. Because again, there's all these ways that we read this passage and we assume women are acting like hussies, and Paul has to whip them in shape by saying, shut up, wear a head covering, and show your submission to your husband. And I think that totally subverts what the passage is about. Completely subverts it. It is a way of reading the passage through our cultural lenses and not taking into account what these things signal in their original context. One of the final points I'd like to make in passing, this is an open question for me, but I think it's an interesting one. Was, woman, was Paul calling for all the women, women to cover their heads? Now, this is significant because, as I alluded to, it was only a, mat a matron, a wife, married to a free man in ancient Rome, that covered her head, and it was something that showed her sexual unavailability. In contrast, for example, the female slave who was perpetually sexually available. Because of this, some think that, well, the wording itself, the language of head coverings, would have signaled to the readers that Paul is only talking about wives. And that's possible. But we do have good evidence that by as early as the second century AD, about 150 years after this is written, all women are covering their heads in church including female slaves, non-free women, unmarried. And this is a practice that continued for most of the last 2,000 years, up until about 70 years ago. So the question is, does that tradition, is it actually rooted in the instructions in Paul, from Paul? Now, if it is, if this is in fact what Paul was arguing, then whereas we have tended to see the head covering in the West as a sign of subordination, it is in fact the opposite in this context. Paul is arguing that, that women who would otherwise be sexually available to the whims and abuses of men in their society, in the worship context of the Christian church, will dress in such a manner that gives her dignity and honor. She is not at your sexual whims. In the church, even the female slave is to be given the honor of a matron. We can't know that from a passage. But I think given the fact that this quickly becomes church practice, I think it's likely that it may have been Paul that started it. What does this tell us today? I'm not suggesting here that therefore, ladies, you're all out of line, you should go get your head coverings, just as I'm not suggesting, let's see, does any, anyone have a hat on in here? Any guy? You do, but that's okay. Any guy? Oh, no. But I'm not also suggesting that you're dishonoring your head if you wear a hat. The reality is, today, the head covering does not carry any of the cultural connotations that it carried in first century Rome. People don't look at a woman with, her, with a head covering on and say, oh, she's sexually unavailable. They say something like, oh, she, she's Amish, or she's Mennonite, or she's Muslim, or it depends, right? But the point is that even in our context, Things like head coverings signal something. They send a message. And clothing does that whether we like it or not. That's the point. It does that whether we like it or not. Now, of course, I'm not trying today to, to draw uh, hard and fast rules. Clothing is cultural. And because of that, there are many different ways of expressing what it means. What is considered a skirt here is called a kilt in Scotland. Right? This is one of the ways that we see that, that uh, the, just like languages only have meaning in a given culture, clothing is a kind of language that has meaning in given cultures. But this still means it has meaning. If I came in here and dropped the F-bomb throughout my sermon, I suspect I would offend many of you, and rightfully so because that word has meaning in our context. Something that sounds very similar to that word in Arabic means only. When I learned Arabic, you know, we thought it was, I was 19, we thought it was just hysterical to just say all these phrases that sounded like American cuss words. And so that was one of the phrases we would drop all the time. But see, it has a very different meaning in the Arabic context. Because then it means only. Our clothing communicates, communicates a message, whether we like it or not. 
after I preached one sermon a year or two ago, I had, I had been lifting a lot and I had gained a bunch of weight. And John Bree afterward made a comment about how tight my shirt was. And it kind of irked me. You know, as if I'm trying to show off, off my muscles or something. But then I walked away and I thought about it and I realized he was right. Because regardless of my intent, I don't need to wear clothing. It's very easy, even for very muscular people, to not highlight their muscles. Uh, clothing actually kind of naturally covers things up. It's very easy to do that. And the fact that even John couldn't help but notice how great my musculature was. Right? The fact that even John noticed that showed that it was drawing attention to myself from the pulpit. It's not where we want the attention to be in the service. Paul is calling on the head covering because it dignifies women in that context as sexually unavailable. And you don't want to send messages when you are speaking and teaching from the front and praying of sexual availability. That's not where you want people's focus to be. Now, often when language like this comes up in the service, there's often the fear that, well, isn't this victim blaming? Listen, I'll say straight up. Blaming a victim of any crime, whether it's simply objectification or for something committed against them, is obviously wrong. Obviously. But we can't miss the point that our clothing communicates something. If I dress in a way that shows how buff I am, and then I say, oh, you noticed how buff I am? Come on. If I'm dressing in a way that highlights that, I'm doing so because I'm proud of my physique and I want to show you. To then pretend as if, you're the, you know, if the problem is exclusively of you, misses the point that my clothing communicates a message. If we focus on the latest fads and fashions, we are communicating a message about our deeply held values. In the early 20th century, and I can't really exact numbers just off the top of my head, but people spent something like a quarter of their annual salary on their wardrobe, which sounds crazy today. Like, oh, they were extravagant. But why was that? Well, it's partly because clothes lasted a really long time. You see, if you were an average person, at least, making an average salary, which back then wasn't that good, you weren't buying clothes every year you were keeping the same few sets of clothes for a very long time. Today we live in a culture in which many expect you and we feel this pressure to always keep up with the latest styles and to replace our clothes with the result that we participate in waste, with the result that often our clothes are only inexpensive because we ship them from foreign countries that don't have the labor requirements that we have and so we can pay them far less, and we in the West get to benefit off of their nearly slave labor. And we do this unconsciously. But our clothes communicate something about our values. If we're worried about keeping up with the latest fads because we put value in that. To dress in a way in that context, right, to maybe go to the thrift stores, or maybe even to buy quality, to buy something that is well-made and is quality and is going to last you years. I'm not saying this means you can't spend money on those. It may mean actually buying more that will last you for a long time. But when that goes out of style, you're communicating something that you don't put value in the passing fads of American culture that are built upon a consumeristic impulse that is deeply hostile to the goods that Jesus teaches us to embrace. All right, I've gone on for way too long. This is why I thought people think I'm long when I follow my script. I'll watch what happens when I get off of it. <laughs> it's okay. All right, I'm going to close. And uh, this is more food for thought. I wanted to give you some food for thought on the text and some food for thought in how it can be applied. Um, I, I'm not pretending this text isn't very challenging, it is. And I'm not pretending that I get every aspect right. But this morning I wanted to hopefully stimulate your heart and mind 
to wrestle with the scriptures and to realize even the texts that seem like they're so completely at odds with our, with our cultural experience, the texts that we are tempted to cast off may actually teach us some very profound messages. So in summary, I just want to repeat the three points I made. made. I believe this passage teaches us that men and women are equally gifted to serve the church. But, point two, while men and women are equally gifted by the Spirit, they are not the same. And that's, even 20 years ago, a recent book by a Christian historian, Carl Truman, called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's a fantastic work of intellectual history. He says in the book that, he starts it by saying that, um, even something like 20 years ago, the statement, I am a man trapped in a woman's body, would have been incomprehensible. And all of a sudden, this has become something that is completely normal and, and that people don't bat an eye at. And there are philosophical reasons for that. We think it's because of what we've learned about science. But this is a deeply philosophical position. And it is one that is rooted in a philosophy that has far more in common with ancient Gnosticism that rejected bodily goodness, material goodness, than it does with the philosophy that is rooted in the gospel. Men and women are equally gifted by the Spirit, but they are not the same. And finally, point three, our clothing communicates a message about our values. And so, ponder that. Let's pray.